Last Sunday afternoon, we began a study of evolution as a threat to the Christian home. Of course, you can expand that and say that the doctrine of evolution is a threat to everybody. We pointed out that those who follow the idea that of, of evolution as to how everything got here are people who have basically denied the existence of God and because of that they are pushed to explain how things got to where they are today. Well, they can't use God because in their minds He doesn't exist. There is no spiritual anything. They are forced to say that matter dead rocks and dirt, no life in them, over chance development, which is no purpose to it. It just happened over multiplied millions of years, starting out in some sort of chemical pool that they don't necessarily know where it came from. And Jody reminded me last week that uh, John, when we saw that puddle over there that they was using as an example of what it must have been like, that it would bubble every once in a while. Uh, that was supposed to, I suppose, imitate the formation of something that finally slithered out onto the shore <laughs> and so on. And so it goes all the way up, as I read last week, uh, the long time ago president of the atheist bunch talked about how it all came through successive things. In fact, I can just look at that again. In the beginning was matter, which begat the amoeba, which begat the worm, which begat the fish, which begat the amphibian, which begat the reptile, which begat the lower animal, which begat the lemur, which begat the monkey, which begat man. Who imagined God? Uh, and this is the genealogy of man, and that's a quote from Charles Smith, who was the former president of the American Athe Association for the Advancement of Atheism. Well, I, every one of those things, and I didn't say this last week, but every one of those things that he brings up, the matter beginning, the amoeba, and all the way the worm and the fish, none of that is proven. That is speculation. What is interesting is that the evolutionist the atheists included, has a lot less evidence to base his or her belief on than do those who believe in the God of the Bible. Because there are just not any facts that uphold those things. And we were noticing, you may remember, the reasons that people then accept evolution. First of all, we pointed out last week that they accept it because they've been told educated people accept it, so they want to be thought of as educated, so they accept it. We then noted the second reason that people believe in evolution was set out by Sir Arthur Keith, who at the time was a member of Britain's Royal College of Surgeons and former president of the Royal Anthropological Institute when he said, Quote, evolution is unproved and unprovable. Then he said, we believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. And again, why would that be? Well, if you're a human being, especially created by God, God's your creator, thus he has a right to order you any way he wants to order you and do with you as he pleases. But if you're an atheist, there is no God well, you're going to follow some kind of code. Somebody has to be the final standard setter for what is right and what is wrong. Of course, what happens there is that for those who do that must finally come down to this. The government, whatever government you're under, must be the highest authority to set the standard of right and wrong. And I've just given you the argument used by the Nazis put on trial at Nuremberg 
when they said you're judging us by the laws of your land. The government of Germany is the one that determined these things and we were only obeying our government. But yet that was met with what a lot of people today wouldn't use and it was met with this. But there is a higher law than just the laws of men over a state or a nation. That higher law is God himself. And I mentioned last week also the philosophy of law, that one of the things that one must conclude is that there can't be a law without a lawgiver. There cannot be a law without a lawgiver. There cannot be a painter or a painting without a painter or a mathematician with ma mathematics without a mathematician. That's just common sense. And I will remind you again of that turtle on the fence post. It didn't get there by itself. It does not have the wherewithal to get on top of that fence post by itself. But if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, the brain you have and the mind you have says, I think I will think a little bit. Number one, I define a turtle and I know what it is. and It does not have the wherewithal under its own power to climb on top of that fence post. Light bulb goes off my mind. It had to have help getting up there. Most of the time we would say simply, a person put it up there. Now that's a logical thinking. That's implication without using all the terms to describe it or setting up a formal syllogism because God made your mind to work that way. Now there's no use, listen to me, there is no use trying to study where God exists or does not exist if you're not going to think. And if you're not going to reason with what are facts that everybody accepts as facts. Now, if you're looking for a way not to believe in God, you're going to find it. But that's what your heart's set on. You're going to find it. Because it is, listen, it is the pre preponderance of the evidence, the preponderance of the evidence that proves the existence of God. It means you have to take the mind that surely you acknowledge you have, gather the facts pertaining to the thing, and think with it and draw the right conclusion. Now, remember the turtle on top of the fence post. You walk out there and you see it, and you say, that's some turtle. He must have just jumped right up on top of that fence post. Now, most of us would say, let's get on either side of him and help him back to the house and put him back in his straitjacket before he hurts him and somebody else. If that's the kind of, quote, thinking, unquote, that a person's doing. But if that same person says, turtles can't do that under their own power, the nature of the way they're made won't let them do that. So it must be that he had to have help. And it had to be an adequate help. One that could take him from where turtles normally are and put him on top of that fence post. Now that's thinking. I may never know who did it, there may have been two people reached out and lifted him up to court how big the turtle is. But you would have to have help and adequate help to put him up there. I remembered after I got through last week something a little akin to that illustration. My grandparents, my mother's parents, moved down to work at the Backpack Division of International Paper Company in about 1941 or two. Mother graduated in high school in uh, Fairview High School, Camden, Arkansas. And they had moved from Bluff City, Arkansas, which is about 23 miles away. And my grandfather worked there for 18 years. He retired and he went back home. They kept their house in Bluff City, their land, and they rented it out. So after 18 years, I think this comes to 1961, 
uh, if I remember right. Anyway, I was I'd go back up there because my great grandparents lived there, and we'd go up there to see them, and I'd go over with him sometimes to their place. It was just not far behind my great grandparents' house at the time. None of it's there now. And we'd go visit uh, Peck and Maddie Nichols. They were the renters, longtime Blessed City residents. And um, I remember when my grandparents first moved back, they had the house redone. I remember I walked down the lane from my great grandparents' house to the back of their place, which was quite a large, uh, had been used as a pasture, big garden. And as we walked across the back, going up to the back of the house, crossed their ways, probably twice the distance of this auditorium's length, there were some old fence posts still there, a little bit of wire on them. And I noticed a bucket that had been put over a fence post and the bottom had rusted out of it and it had slid down the fence post. Well, I knew somebody put it there. It's obvious. It did just jump up there. It's not, the turtle had more going for it than it did. It's a living, living being. And my grandfather, as we were talking, when we walked across over there, I guess I was in ninth grade. He was just looking at stuff and knew they were moving back up there. And he saw that bucket. He said, Bud, see that bucket over there? He said, just before we moved to Cullendale 18 years ago, I finished the last garden out here and I hung that bucket up on top of that, that fence post and it's still there 18 years later. Well, I got more facts and information directly from a witness and I found out how that bucket got up there. <laughs> done a lot of changing. Weather had done that. So had the post, the fence, and the bucket. <laughs> and my grandfather. In fact, when he did that, I was... Not a twinkle in anybody's eye. I didn't exist. Now think how simple that is. And yet you exercise the mind that you have to take in the evidence, the adequate evidence. And then with the bucket, I didn't, might not know who put the tur the sorry to say the terrapin, that'd work too, the turtle up there. But I had testimony from the very one to put the bucket up there. He had no reason to lie. I'd call that uh, proper testimony. Now it gets more intricate in the investigation of things that are around us. But it's the same mind doing the same kind of reasoning. Facts are involved in both cases. And you may have to do a whole host of various intricate investigations. Maybe it all done through microscopes or whatever else to gather the facts that bear upon what you're trying to do to be able to come to a conclusion about something. But the mind still operates the same way. That's a very important point. And we need to understand that. I think I was giving you, or about ready to give you, the third reason that people accept evolution. Or, and these people have examined the evidences and have, on the basis of those evidences, come to the conclusion that evolution is a tenable theory. Notice I said theory. These people are sincere and usually open-minded. I don't doubt there's a lot of them like that out there. The fellow I had teach my course in geology in school was a geological engineer plus a PhD, and I think one of the best teachers I ever had. He never pushed at all the evolutionary hypothesis. But when we studied geology, it was just the way he operated as to the ages and the various whatever strata and this kind of thing. But he never pushed it. 
and you were free in a state school like that with him to form whatever of you you were. Now, it's true. He accepted it and worked with it like it was a proven fact. But nevertheless, he was not rabid in his evangelism for atheism or for evolution. I really doubt the man was an atheist. He might be more like the one we're talking about now. Make a choice. They believe to be right and firmly believe that evolution can be proven true. They just never maybe go through what it takes to assemble all of that and then start reasoning with it and get the implications of it. Now the question I would raise in noticing that third one as to why people follow evolution or believe it, accept it. I have to say for myself, are they right? That is his third one. Are they right? If they are right, then evolution has to be proven to be true. Or it's a special creation. It's one or the other. Or we might say, you never can tell. Well, that's the fine situation. That's the agnostic. Well, there may be some things that we never can tell about a lot of things. I felt that way many times about my brethren. <laughs> Never could tell about a lot of things. And especially when they were working awful hard to appear one thing while there was something else and trying to hide it from everybody. Now you say, well, you're talking bad about your brethren. Have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> they ever read about Ananias and Sapphira? What were they trying to do? Appear to be great, fine servants of God, but what were they? Hypocrites, liars. If you're going to be faithful to God in the church, you've got to realize they're going to be there. So when I hear certain brethren say, well, I'm not going to be a part of that group. There's a whole bunch of hypocrites there. Okay, just go on the route you're going. You'll be with all the hypocrites someday, and you'll never get away from them. It doesn't make any sense. I want us to notice the matter of this simple fact. When people, I said it last week, but when people advocate and strive for teaching evolution in the public schools, as it's done commonly, nobody raises you. People don't even know enough to raise questions. You ever notice that? Before you raise some questions, you have to have learned some things. You never would have had the people on the day of Pentecost saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? If they had not learned something from the preaching of Peter, that what? Pricked them in their heart. They had to have the necessary wherewithal to cause the question to form. And so I have to say here right up front, if I were going to be debating this, well, no, it's not true. Now, I have in my presentation here, I haven't been drawing from scientists and others of recent years. Most of the, in fact, I guess all of them, unless I refer to it just off the top of the head, somebody, have, were, were the ones you noticed when I was a young person back in the 60s or 70s in that time period. These were the fellows that were known and had been known that I've quoted from. The reason I'm doing that is because a lot of these things were answered a long time ago and people today just don't know it. Maybe it's because of the way that information is disseminated today so widely, come so many ways on YouTube and whatever else that you can find all this stuff. I must admit it makes it a lot easier to research a lot of things, but you have to be careful. I have found it a bit amusing to notice something Somebody's put on YouTube that says thus and so and thus and so, and so I watch it, never said any such thing. And what they're representing themselves to say on various subjects, they didn't in whatever it is, just get you to watch it, because the more they get to watch it, the more money they're going to make and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Money's at the bottom of a lot of things. A fellow by the name of Sir Arthur Keith, who lived quite a few years ago, 
He was at one time one of evolution's most prominent defender in Great Britain. Said this, and I quote, evolution is unproved and unprovable. But he's still an evolutionist. And I think you'd have to see, you say, you see that that's why we notice the second reason people believe in evolution, or the first one too, is that uh, if you're educated, you do. And you, the second one is I don't dare deny evolution because that's going to push me into believing in the God because things got here some way. Dr. Robert A. Milligan, Nobel Laureate in Physics, as well said, and I quote, he's another older one, the pathetic thing is that we have scientists who are trying to prove evolution, which no scientist can ever prove. Now, if you read some of this stuff today and listen to it, you may think that scientists are just now doing that. They were doing it back then. Dr. Theodore Tomisian, who's a nuclear physicist or was with the Atomic Energy Commission, said this, quote, scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men. And the story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. It is a tangled mishmash of guessing games and figure jaggling. Now that was said quite a few years ago when it was first written by this fellow. You can say the same thing today. And some are saying it. I can't remember, Ken, I can't remember this fellow's name. Uh, that's the uh, scientist at Rice. What is his name? James Tour. Now he's right up there at the top. And he's making it clear nobody's proven these things. Now he's getting kicked back from folks. But he said, all I do is say, regardless of whether we can discover it and prove it in the future, it has not been proven now. There's nothing that anybody has that's a fact that proves evolution. Now you can go listen to him. And if you want to set it up, he'll talk with you. And he's a Ph.D., what is it, physics? Can't remember. Something to do with it. But he's, um, he's a renowned character. I think I sent this to you and um, maybe to uh, Stephen. I think I sent it to you. I don't know whether you ever looked and found it, but I sent some of the stuff that he did and to John. But now he is quite a character. But he has the same kickback that, other people did, whether it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. My point is, this stuff is there. And if you don't want to receive it, well, you won't receive it. Same thing's true about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does the Bible have anything to say at all about baptism? Certainly. Well, then why aren't people believing what the Bible says about baptism? They say the Bible's the word of God. For the same reason people go off into error on anything. You read Romans 1, guess what? Everybody on earth at one time fully believed in God. What do you have in Romans 1? Why people and how people left God. And here's the main thing. They desired not to retain God and their knowledge. You ever wonder why? Because if you don't want to submit to God, then do away with Him and you don't have to. Well, how can a person do that? Because we deceive ourselves. Does the Bible say anything about beware of being deceived? That is, beware of believing a lie? It certainly does. Professor H.H. H. Newman, who prominent evolutionist in times past, University of Chicago, in a very rare burst of candor, I'd have to say it that way, admitted this, and I'm quoting, Reluctant as he may be to admit it, honesty compels the evolutionist to admit that there is absolutely no proof of organic evolution. Then another, that's an unquote. The director of the National Center for Research in Paris, France, once remarked, and I quote, I think this is really quite interesting. Evolution is a fairy tale for adults. That's the way I've thought of it a long time. It's one of the best books of fiction you'll ever read is the evolution story. Then he went ahead to say, I quote, this theory has helped nothing in science. 
it is useless, unquote. It still is. It would not bother me at all to go before any of these scientists today, or whoever they may be, philosophers either, and point these things out. Now, what Tour is doing is saying, show me the evidence. And they haven't done it. They got upset at him. Well, it seems to me Stephen got some folks upset at him one time, and they killed him over it. And the Bible says of his preaching the gospel, they could not withstand the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. And there's the problem. You know what they prove themselves to be? Unreasonable and dishonest. That's exactly what happens. Brother Woods, and I have done it too in my debates, pointed out that one reason we have questions for the opponent is that the way a person handles a question pertinent to the proposition, the way he deals with answering it, goes a long way, and I always would say it to the audience, as Brother Woods and others would, goes a long way in saying whether this fellow is an honest person person in pursuing the truth or whether he is not and thus I would say and we're on trial before God in you as to how we answer these questions because of what they would tell everybody here you're the jury and you have to weigh that and the fact of the matter is in a jury case in court that's what the juror has to do he has to look and see if this witness is telling the truth. Well, he swore to tell the truth. <laughs> I suppose one of the places to note where people swear, swear to tell the truth all the time, but a lot of it's not done, is in Congress. Because every time they swear those folks in, they swear to tell the truth. Now, who is foolish enough to say, well, they swore to tell the truth. That is, everybody that's ever testified in Congress and swore to tell the truth. He told it. <laughs> well, if you believe that, you believe that turtle got on top of that fence post on his own power. Dr. Dwayne Gish, who was associate director of the Institute of Creation Research, once commented, and this is 40 years ago, and I like the way he said this. Now, he, of course, is a believer. A frog turning into a prince overnight is a fairy tale. Now listen, but a frog turning into a man over millions of years, we call science. And that's what I've said all along, is that that's why the evolutionary hypothesis is nothing but a great theory propagated by people, fiction actually, who don't want to believe in special creation in the first place. Now in a little time we have before I close on this for our part today, I want to emphasize again, evolution is not a fact of science. All the wishes of evolution is notwithstanding. I even say evolution is not a scientific matter. I pointed out to you last week, it's outside the realm of scientific method. We want to look at that for a little bit. Science, I've got to say it this way, as science can tell you absolutely nothing about evolution. Were it possible for evolution to be proven true, it would be philosophers who proved it true, and it would not be scientists. Now, you should know by now why I would make such a statement as that. Because as much good as science has done, and it has, and hopefully will, because a scientist, smallpox was dealt with, and the plague is not what it was back hundreds of years ago. And in general, science has strengthened man in general. It's added years to his life expectancy. But science still doesn't have all the answers. And there are good reasons for the fact that science does not have the answers. And really can say absolutely nothing about evolution. The reasons result from the limitations of science and its method. Now, this is one thing that needs to be saddled on the scientist who denies the existence of God 
and who claims everything therefore came from dead rocks and dirt over millions of years of accidental chance evolution with no purpose to it to where we are today. It's because of the limitations of the scientific method. And these folks don't want to say there are any limitations. You hear an atheistic scientist, and he'll, he'll pretty well come across this, if there's any answer ever given to anything, science will give it to you. But it won't. A fellow by the name of Harris Rall, R-A-L-L, -L, in his book, Faith for Today, gives an excellent description of science when he says this, and I'm quoting, Science stands for a way of study and an attitude of mind. That's true. To leave theories and prejudices to one side, to bring an open mind and ask only for truth, to study concrete facts with endless patience, to try to find an order of behavior in the world, that would be natural law, as indicated by these facts. This is the spirit and method of science. You go find all the PhDs that exist in various scientific areas, every one of them, and ask if they can take the scientific method, which is, is the area they work in, and have anything to do by using the scientific method with origins and see what they say. I've said it over and over again. I know it. I've studied it. And the scientists will say it. The scientific method is anchored to what you can examine with your five senses. And if you can't examine it with your five senses, then it can't work in science. Now, there's not a soul in the world that can examine origins with their five senses. I don't care if you graduated from Harvard and Yale and Princeton and wherever it might be. It's not going to work. You have five senses. And the scientific method is severely limited. I'll put it that way in at least five areas. First of all, the scientific method is limited to what can be observed with the five senses. I just said that. That's the first one. Dr. Paul Wise, in his book, Elements of Biology, stated, and I quote, All science begins with observation, the first step of the scientific method. At once, this delimits the scientific domain. Something that cannot be observed cannot be investigated by science. I, see, I don't think a lot of people who have never really gone into the sciences seriously even understand that there's a scientific method. The genuine scientist does, whether they're biologists or geologists or chemists or whoever they are. Dr. Douglas Marsland has mentioned in his book, Principles of Modern Biology, that, quote, the primary basis of all scientific thinking is observation. Now, this next fellow I'm going to mention has been dead a number of years, as well as some of these others. I said I was using people that I used when I was a young person. Dr. George Gaylord Simpson stated in an article of science in Science Magazine, and I quote, It is inherent in any definition of science. That statements cannot, that cannot be checked by observation are not really saying anything, or at least they are not science. Now that's the reason I said that if origins are to be dealt with, they have to be dealt with by the philosopher. What does that mean? What do the facts of science today imply about how they got here? That's what we're talking about. Remember the turtle on the post? That's exactly what we're talking about. Remember, there never has been a law without a lawgiver. Law of gravity? I have to have a lawgiver. The next is the scientific method is limited to the present. 
that should be obvious from the first one. You've got to examine it the five senses. Well, if you're not in the presence, you can't do that. Dr. Henry Morris and John Whitcomb have commented in their classical work, The Genesis Flood, quote, Since historical geology, unlike other sciences, cannot deal with currently observable and reproducible events, it is manifestly impossible ever really to prove by the scientific method any hypothesis relating to pre-human history, unquote. That's the way it is. And if you don't have God in the Bible saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or you read a little further, you come over to Genesis 6 where God does destroy the world by water and revelation from the creator, and in this case the destroyer, tells us that. Now, that's what the scientist who's oriented strictly to empirical facts, what he can see. That's the person Paul talks about that doesn't want to be knowledgeable, doesn't even like to call it knowledge, from revelation. And he says, these things are foolishness unto him. What things? Things that come of revelation. A fellow by the name of E. No Wolfius liked to know what his parents were thinking and give him a name like that. In this book, Science, God, and You remarked and I quote, science seeks to explain the behavior of that which is and to check its explanation by means of experiments. But this experimental requirement can be met only in the present time. The past and especially the beginning of things lies beyond the grasp of this method and so science can only speculate about the origin and early history of this world. Now, I think that's some pretty good material. But we'll take a little longer and go one more. The third point that we want to make is to the limitations of the scientific method. Science is amoral. It's non-moral. You do all this stuff and you can either help mankind with it or you can hurt mankind with it. But just it by itself, it's just there. There's nothing in science itself to determine whether nuclear energy will be used to destroy cancer cells or entire cities. People do that, don't they? Science gives the facts, empirical facts, of what's here that man's discovered through his five senses and the scientific method. Decisions based on those facts do not fall into the scientific realm. Or, as Wolfius has commented, and I quote, science has always concerned itself with the material world and its behavior as distinct from the spiritual realities of life. Science is better suited to describe than to prescribe. And even when it describes, it is far from infallible. Albert, let's see, do I want to go that route? May not have time to do it. I'll go one more here, finish out this one. A fellow by the name of Albert Wells, he's an evolutionist or was, stated in his work, The Christian Message in a Scientific Age, and I'm quoting him, as knowledge of the universe expands and man's position within it becomes more central and more critical, so increases the demand for meaning as well as for effective means of moral and spiritual control of the achievements science has made possible. And then it's emphasized science cannot give us these. He goes ahead to say the scientific task fosters integrity and character. A persistent and passionate devotion to truth cannot help but build trustworthiness in the man who engages in the quest. But science is not at all sufficient to itself. It is, after all, quite limited as far as being able to answer the real questions that it's concerned with. 
So science, with its method, is simply not equipped to deal with moral, spiritual, or ethical issues. And it's limited there. No, you say otherwise. They know that. Well, I'll hold here and we'll look at another and some more of this material next time around. Brethren, I don't know how to say it other than to say what makes a person want to deny the existence of God. I said last week, and I'll say it now on as long as I can. Just look at those trees out front. And then boldly saying, they do not evidence design. I might as well say, look at this fan. And say, that does not evidence design. As I had to look out there at that tree and say it doesn't. Now that's as simple as how that turtle got on the fence post. He's there. He didn't get there by himself. So there had to be an adequate cause for him being there. And there has to be an adequate cause that that tree out front has what it has as its attributes to be a live oak tree. It was put together in an eternal mind. And that's the way it is with the whole universe. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered, and not a sparrow falls that he doesn't know. The eternal mind just knocks me over the more I try to figure it out. And we would not know certain things except it was by revelation of that mind. Now, he's given us natural things, and there's no law without a law giver, and thus there are natural laws. Well, you know, they've been here working all along before man ever discovered them. When man discovers them, what does that say? That it just happened when that goes against all the rules of science or that it was designed by a being who could bring it into existence and as right of Hebrew says concerning the second person of the Godhead, the incarnate word, that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Let me ask you this. When this world comes to an end, as the Bible describes it coming to an end, you know how it's going to come to an end? I do. The Word of God that spoke it out of nothing into existence and made every law, even those today we haven't discovered yet, is going to speak, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works of that area and will be burned up. And the conclusion of Peter there, in view of that, what manner of person ought we to be in our holy living? This system, this natural system, this cosmos, our solar system included, will disappear as if it never was by the word of God. And he'll raise the dead, some to damnation eternally and some to glorification. There will be a judgment. Time will not be there to say, this year is a long time I've had to stay in line. No. Time as we know it won't exist. I often think of that when we come down to when we die. And we say, well, how long has the rich man been in torments in the Hadean world? Well, from our standpoint, at least 2,000 years or thereabouts. But he's not over there measuring time like we do because there's not any time there like here. He doesn't exist in a place like we exist anymore. But he's still the same person, but he's not in a physical body any more than Abraham was. I found it interesting. Here's a, a man, the rich man over there in spirit form in a place that's not material and not governed by time and space. Abraham who lived hundreds and hundreds of years before he did and he recognizes Abraham. How? How? Abraham doesn't have a physical body. Besides that, if he did, this man didn't live when he was walking the earth. How do they know? I don't know. But I do know this. I want to be faithful to my God as the Word of God teaches me to be faithful to Him because I want to experience what Abraham 
and Lazarus were experiencing. If I stay alive on this earth, the Lord comes back. I want to know what it's like to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of eye at the last trump when the dead shall raise. And we'll go up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Does that ever fascinate you to realize that that's motivation to be faithful, to do what God said? Because we'll go on when this whole system is long gone. All this big turmoil among scientists over all of the affairs of this world that only their five senses in the present can investigate. Not here anymore. Long gone. And as far as it doing any good to somebody like Einstein's salvation, none. That only works. What Einstein found out only helped things here. It certainly doesn't do it where he's gone <laughs> or anybody else that goes there. What depends on you getting the right place when you die is your faithful adherence to the teachings of Jesus Christ and nothing stops you. That's what we need. If you're not a Christian, we hope you'll become one today. We haven't had a lot to say about along that line, but we most here think I already know all that. We hope you'll take it seriously and believe it as a child of God if you sin, that you'll remember you always need to repent in that case and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And if you're therefore subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.